All right, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Masquerade of Angels. Uh, today we're joined with Lisa O'Hare. And hi, Lisa. And uh, Lisa has a, uh, uh, a degree in business administration from San Jose State University in California, where you lived until 2011. Uh, she worked for many years in law firms, starting as a legal floater uh, secretary and ending up in information technology and went on to work for engineering companies in Silicon Valley. Uh, you're now retired. Um, but since you've been retired, you've discovered that you had psychic abilities. Um, you reached out to Terry Lovelace, who wrote the book Instant the Devil's Den, and uh, he encouraged you to write your own book. And you did, which is called Abducted and Furious. Okay, so thank you for, for uh, being on the show with us today. Um, so you very late in this in the game you realize you are a medium okay uh from ted and actually i think jennifer it was the same with you it wasn't until years after that you kind of realized you had abilities is that correct that's correct, correct. yes yeah that's um, correct for me ted, with you it's a bit different though because you were having out-of-body experiences when you were like five you were floating in the kitchen where your parents were talking about your auntie coming over or your cousin or something coming over and even though you're in a separate room you you uh you were there and heard them um so lisa like carla turner okay she said by she got to the age of 40 and she had all these weird incidents that happened throughout her life and she said you just have to kind of connect the dots to realize what was going on. Is that what happened to you as well, is it? Yes, um, I did have odd experiences growing up, and uh, but I also moved around a lot. And you know, when you move around in the States or go move to foreign countries, I think you don't feel like you fit in anyway. So it's hard to, to take these little incidences that don't seem to be connected in any way um, and Cre create like a little story about them. So I didn't, I would have, you know, a thing where I would have one dream that came true. And then I would have, you know, just odd incidences. So there was just no, in some ways there was no words for these things. Cause if I were a psychic, I would have these things all the time was my reasoning. I would know what to label them, but I didn't uh, in that case because you know, I would have, like I said, a recurring daydream. And it was like a vision, I guess. Uh, I had one when I was 10 and it happened like for eight or eight or seven nights in a row. And then it came true. So what is that? I mean, it, is it psychic? <laughs> Why would you have the same daydream, as I called it, every night for a week when it came true? So for me, there was no label to put on these things. Uh, so I just kind of, you know, thought, kept them in my mind and didn't, wasn't able to connect the dots because there was no rhyme or reason. There was no continuity. I mean, that same thing happened to me again when I was 16. Um, it was just, but I'd finally stayed in a school where I might be able to graduate with my class. And I kept having this daydream at night that was saying I was going to move to a foreign country. Um, and I was like, no, <laughs> oh, I don't want that. Um, but yeah, it happened. So that happened again. So that's only two times. So I do have those pictures and I do get pictures, uh, in my mind. Uh, it happened when I was in my thirties, but so, you know, it just seems very scattered from my point of view. So mm -hmm. I think it's too hard to connect the dots unless you can find somebody who can say, Oh yeah, that happened to me too. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Also, uh, just from what you said so far, uh, abduction starts in childbirth. Yeah, so usually around um, they kind of stop when you're about eight years old, and then they okay. come back when you're in your later teens. So, like you said, sixteen, uh, and then later on they come back again when you're in your thirties. Oh yeah, when I heard you're, that, I, yeah, I was amazed. <laughs> yeah, you've just described the basic life cycle of an abductee right there. Oh, wow. um, um, okay, so uh, how did you end up getting involved in being a medium and psychic then? 
Um, what happened was uh, I was basically, you know, at home and I started hearing my spirit guide and um, then uh, he was like, well, you need to, you're a medium and you need to find a, a, a person to mentor you. And I was like, okay, I'll meditate. I'll, you know, prepare. That's what they told me to do. Just have patience and make sure you meditate. So I did do that. Um, and then I was at a hair, my hair salon and they said, somebody said they knew somebody was a medium and she also mentored people. So I went there to talk to her about my mother had passed away. And she said, oh, you're just like me. <laughs> so you're a medium. So I really didn't believe it. And I actually still don't really. But anyway, um, I started working with her, trying to build up the mediumship. And with that, actually, it, things got weirder and weirder. I mean, my life just did a 180. And I kind of felt like I fell into um, this world I didn't know my way around. And things started happening to me that were just outside of my reality, like outside of my frame of reference. So that's how it happened. And I can honestly say that while it's been interesting, it's also like a separate world. It's not, I'm like, I feel like sometimes I'm in my one reality and sometimes in another reality and they don't mix, <laughs> you know? You're either in one or the other. So that's, sorry, I might've gotten off track there about the whole mediumship thing, but did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, so this woman introduced you to it, okay? And uh, eventually you reached out to Terry Lovelace. Was that later or before? It was later, uh, much later. I actually wrote my book in chronological order. So um, I was just trying to find my place, right? Because uh, for me, I'm kind of a straightforward and fact-based person. So I was trying to reach out and talk to people in the same situation or similar enough so that I could understand, have more understanding. So I did read every book I could find. I did find your book, Ted. Um, and I don't think I read the whole thing. I read some of it, but also sometimes when you read these books, they're not your current experience and you cannot relate to them. And you don't read them the same way you would if you had a lot of experience and then went back to them, right? Because when you go back to them, then you're like, oh, that's what that means. Oh, that's what that means. But in the yeah. beginning, it's so much information that, and some of it sounds outlandish and outside of your experience. It's hard to, it's just hard to get. Yeah, yeah. Your so you, uh, you ended up becoming a medium. And at some point, you started communicating with spirit guides. Yes, I actually started communicating with spirit guides before all of that. Um, but what happened, what, it's weird. So somebody told me, oh, guess what? You know what? Everyone has spirit guides. When you need a parking place, you just say spirit guides, find me my parking place. So I tried that and it worked. <laughs> no, so, um, so that's how I got kind of introduced to spirit guides. Then I just started talking to them in my mind all the time and meditating before I went to sleep. I would talk to my spirit guides. So um, that's sort of how that worked. Um, but, um, I didn't realize that I felt, well, now I feel that they're a little bit of a negative force actually. Yeah, and yeah. I don't talk to my spirit guides anymore. And, um, if they try to talk to me, I just try to shut them down because I don't want to know what they have to say. And can I ask you, what did they look like? Do Do you know? I don't know. Um, I did in my book, I talk about seeing two praying mantises. Now, um, I don't know if they're my spirit guides. I've been told that they are, but I never saw them. I just heard them in my head. And okay. Um, so. And OK, so you were being abducted while this was going on as well. Is that right? Yes, I believe so. So did you ever ask your spirit guides about that? I did. In my book, uh, I say that I um, asked them. I, I felt a negative presence. So, you know, while you're talking to your spirit guides and everything, it's almost like you become more sensitive to things. 
And so I started becoming sensitive to smells and sensitive to feeling something in my house. And so I would also feel like rooms or areas were negative or I would, uh, I would, there was one, I used to live in sun, near Sunnyvale, California, and I was at the, at the gas station and I got there and I felt like I could see and feel like some sort of ritual going on with drumming and, you know, and I just got this panicked feeling and I left and I never went back to that, oh, that uh, gas station ever again. Um, I just couldn't, it felt too negative. And so I noticed when I was walking around in the mall, which I avoid now, um, that some, some of the stores felt negative and some felt positive. So I just started to slowly, and it's very, I think it's kind of nefarious actually, and very, it creeps up on you. So um, I just, so with this instance, I, um, felt like I, something very negative was in my room and I asked my spirit guides, what is that? And then they told me that it was the greys and they were here to take me to, uh, to their ship. And I was scared to death, you know, because at that point I had no idea that there was any, anything going on. So to find out that there was some negative entity in your room with you that you can't see, <laughs> is pretty yeah. improving yeah so uh what was negative about the spirit guides and also what was positive um it well the interesting thing about the spirit guides was they appeared to be giving me information but at the same time it was very vague so it would be some it would be like a horoscope you know so the horoscope would say you are learning many things you know it's like okay I, I can, uh, you know, attribute that to me or ever, 40 people can attribute to that to themselves. So I, in that way, at, at first it felt positive, but then I realized it was very cryptic, you know, and it depended on your assumption or your perception of the situation, not the actual thing that they were doing. So the negative came because they would send me pictures and this happened in my 30s too. Um, I would get pictures and I felt like I was getting them from the person. Like for instance, I would be on the bus going to work because I worked in San Francisco at that time and I lived in San Jose. So I'd have to take the 603 train, which is the time. And then I would feel like I would see a picture in my head from someone in their, when they were in their backyard uh, at a barbecue. And I did not know what that was. And I would say to myself, why am I getting these pictures? So in this case, I started getting pictures that I felt were help or direction. So they would say, for instance, I'd get a picture of a certain restaurant, which meant go to that restaurant. So over time, I learned that the pictures are negative. And so I stopped. But well, how did you learn that? I think what happened was enough negative things happened that I felt that, you know, or made the connection. Maybe I connected the dots finally. Oh my gosh, every time I do what they tell me, it's something goes wrong or it's the wrong way or, you know, uh, because. And can you give an example of that? Yes, I can actually. So I was uh, getting gang stalked all the time and nobody believes you because they're so insidious and, and subtle about how they act. Um, so I got really scared and I started, I went to a, um, I found a self-defense gym and it was a really hardcore place actually. Um, but I went there and I kept getting this picture that I should go to the, or actually, let me go backwards a little. Okay, uh, so I used to go to the acupuncturist, which I found is not a good thing for me. And I kept get smelling a smoke, like cigarette smoke. And so I thought it was really weird. And I didn't, I always felt uncomfortable whenever smoking man showed up. So I went to this gym to, 
protect myself or learn how to protect myself from the gang stalkers, or at least feel more safe. And so that I could protect myself if I did get jumped. So I was there, I got a picture that said, go to the, instead of being in fight basics, which is where you learn to punch people, be in the self-defense class. But I didn't like the self-defense class because the women in there were extremely uh, strong. They would throw me around. Now I'm gonna be 63 soon. So that was when I was 60. And these little girls were just, they were really rough. So I, I, I'm like, no, I'm not gonna do that. And so then, uh, then I got it again. I kept getting it. Well, that's what I realized uh, along well, a little bit before that was when I kept getting the, if I got the picture more than once, for one thing, it wasn't mine. It didn't come from me. So it wasn't my memory. And um, the second thing was, was that it was some, it's coming from outside of me. Somebody is sending that to me. And so when they started sending me these pictures, I, if I didn't do it, things worked out better for me. So I didn't go to the self-defense class. So it was interesting because the people in that place, I think it was them sending it to me. So I kept smelling the smoke, <laughs> the cigarette smoke. And I thought, this is a really weird place. I mean, it's weirder. It's starting to feel weirder. So then uh, I stayed in the fight basics class. Um, then I got another picture that I should go and take the test for the self-defense. Well, I hadn't taken it long enough um, to take the test. But So then uh, these this guy started telling me, you got to take the advanced class, go to the advanced class. And, uh, and then I started getting pictures in my head to go to the advanced class. So I eventually stopped going there because the place felt extremely negative. All of a sudden I kept smelling the smoke. And, um, and I want to say that it took me a very long time to figure out that these pictures are negative. Um, and I feel like it was, it's because my perception is being mucked with about, you know, what's good for me and bad for me. But I just spent, I think I had enough experiences. In the beginning, at, at first, you know, like let's say there was a storm going on. Arizona has huge storms. Um, I would say, spirit guides, help me get home. Help me avoid this storm. And then I would go around, or, you know, and I followed the instructions. And that helped. But then at some point, it just started turning. Like once I relied on it, it just started making my life a lot harder. And um, and also, they were all whoever it is, were trying to get me to do what they wanted. So that's the main goal. The goal of sending me those pictures is to get me to do what they tell tell me to. And if I don't, my life's a lot better. And if I do, my life's a lot worse. So. Mm -hmm. I, it was just like over time, I just finally realized that I was going in the wrong direction by listening to them. Right. What do you think the end game was then? I think it's basically, basically control because um, once I realize that I don't, if I don't do what they say, then I don't do anything they say. So um, I... You know, so like they were trying to get me to pick, take, stop putting gel on my nails. And I did it for a while. And actually, so I've done it at least twice. And then I just realized, you know what, I really like this. So they continually, they always, so then they started telling me what color I should get. And, you know, you know, at first you think it's your own idea. And that's the problem. You think it's you. You think, oh, I just had this great idea. I should paint my nails purple. And, uh, but it's not you, it's coming from somewhere else. And um, it's for control of your memories, your imagination, and basically your mind. That's what I believe it is. Mm. I'm so glad to hear you say, say this. Uh, it, it really pleases me that you are fully aware of what they've been doing to you in your life. Uh, so many people do resist that truth 
uh, and and they, they create this block for themselves until they open up one day and realize I'm just a puppet and I'm manufacturing something for these beings mm -hmm. and in all their sweetness and kindness and truth that they feed into me has a payoff somewhere down the line. Mm -hmm. and so congratulations. <laughs> uh, you've come a long way. I sure have. <laughs> it's been a hard, horrible road as well. Mm. Uh, now, when you wrote the book, they weren't happy with that, were they? No, they weren't. It was funny. Actually, it was weird. So first they're like, yeah, 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 write this book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I'm like, okay, well, then you have to help me with it. And so they did. They helped me with it. So I put in all the stuff about them, you know, the other narcissism and you know, all of my experiences that I had. And I then I tried to, you know, solve the problem, which I think that they wanted because they wanted me, wanted to know how I would solve a problem like this, truthfully. Um, what would I do? Would I be methodical? Would I, you know, how would I, and, you know, also with the books that uh, suddenly became, I suddenly became aware of, which they also control, I found, is my awareness when I notice things, when I don't notice things. Um, then, you know, because I was doing what they wanted, then they could block everything. So, you know, it was very, it was it was a good experience, but it was just bad because uh, but I'm glad I wrote it because I'm so lucky to have been able to find all these people that are like me uh, and find a community. Because if you don't have that, you can literally go crazy because they want you to stay at home and be isolated and not have any friends. They make sure you don't. And all of these things so that you are scared all the time and all that. So yeah, I wrote, I did write the book. They helped me with it. Um, and then they're the ones that said, put, put your um, journal in your book. And I think that turned out to be a really good for me and a really good idea because then people can read that and they can see how difficult it is to have these weird situations. Plus go into your subconscious mind to find out what's in there too and then try to put the puzzle pieces together. And I just mm -hmm. wanted to encourage people. So I'm glad I did it, but <laughs> it was it's still hard. Yeah. Um, just your point about the uh, narcissism. Um, I was looking at what you put down. You were comparing humans to what the aliens do. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, you give a, a, a number of examples that human narcissists do but then the aliens do it, but they go one step further, it seems. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, they are like um, artists, actually, in a negative way about how to manipulate people. I mean, they are extreme master manipulators. Everything they do is a purpose for them to gain something from you. And so they, you know, so you think... So that's why it takes so long for people to wake up. It's because of their master manipulation techniques. So everything they do is sort of like humans and you can see the correlation between it. But, and that's why I put that, uh, that table in there is because so that you can see for yourself how they mirror you, how their actions are really self-serving. They're not really about helping anyone except for themselves. And if you can if you can take regular narcissists, which I'm not so sure that the regular narcissists are regular, they might be hybrids. They might be, you know, they might be aliens too. Um, but they're like it's an infiltration, and it's really slow. It's very insidious in how they sort of creep up on you. They don't uh, like announce themselves. They slowly creep, slowly, slowly, slowly. And I do believe that is the way that we, so many people are fooled by human narcissists because it's not obvious and a lot of it's hidden and it's hidden in a way uh, to make it seem, make you seem crazy and the other people to seem normal. 
and you know just the way they do it it's it's very it's formulaic to a degree but since there are so many different ets and so many different human narcissists their techniques are similar but to connect the dots and to see where the similarities are is really difficult and you have to have had multiple experiences with different types of narcissists to be able to see it so for instance my parents are both narcissists they're both past but my mom was kind of like a she like did triangulation she has she had four daughters so there's a lot of triangulation there was a lot of um learned helplessness i can't do this i need you to help me then there was, you know, telling one daughter one story, telling another daughter a opposite story. So they were fighting with each other to try to help her. And just, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that's a personal relationship with a parent. And it's not always obvious if you had a husband, let's say, that was like that. You wouldn't be able to see it because he wouldn't use the same tactics as a mother, you know? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it's difficult. It's a difficult thing. Yeah. They use us as bait. Yes. Yeah, we're we're oftentimes used bait to set up other people to bring new people into the fold. Yes. If they start, you know, just siphoning off the energy, uh, we are producing so many products for them, or they wouldn't be doing it because they're, yeah. they're they're getting something out of it. They're not going to just this is not just a game they're playing right they're, they're thriving on what they're getting from us right exactly and especially with the strife like you know like divide and conquer that is a huge one right uh with people with the political field and everybody fighting with each other and feeling like they're right and you know drama in your family so all drama i think is all fuel for them and also, uh, yeah, you're right. I, I'll feel baited by people too, you know. And do you do you actually bite on the bait? I mean, once I realize where the bait is, then I don't bite on it. <laughs> but, <you know? laughs> well, I found as as we progress and start connecting dots, it it becomes more difficult for them to fool us. Right. Because we see the that we can look forward and see the scam and see the reward they're setting us up for for themselves. Right. So they're very self-serving. It's all about them. Mm -hmm. It I is. See, I see a uh, dual force in your life though as well because it seems that when you're writing the book, in the end, uh, they got angry with you, okay? But at the beginning, they wanted you to write the book and they wanted you to put in the part about your journal. That suggests to me that there was a different force acting there. Oh, Have I also found... see, I was going to say, I also see the military involvement in your case as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm starting to really notice that because before, I mean, yeah, I would see these strange creatures and, uh, you know, and then I would see the military. And I heard, I mean, you know, in the very beginning, when you're reading that stuff, it's just, like I said, it seems outlandish. But, um, yeah, I think there is a military component. My dad was in the Army, and um, but he was out by the time I was born. But I really did, you know, when I was looking at my subconscious, which they won't allow me to do anymore, by the way. <laughs> so my tools in my book, I can't use them anymore because they just block it or they it won't let me see anything. Um, so yeah, there is a military element. There seems to be a lot of, dare I say it, like invisible, like they're wearing some invisible clothing or something. And uh, they show up, well, there'll be times when I'll be, I'll wake up coughing and I'll know it's because they put some sort of gas or ch it feels like gritty, like chalk actually, or talcum powder. That's how it, sound, feel, it makes it feel in my lungs because I am asthmatic. And so I'll hear my husband coughing or I coughing. I got a fan right from <laughs> next to my bed and I turn it on so it clears out the room. But yeah, I think that we are taken by the military, both of us. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are in some sort of program that we don't even know what it is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, Ted, can I ask you something real quick? It's about Carla. She sure. was abducted by the military as well, wasn't she? 
if she what now say that again she was abducted by the military before uh well yes and supposedly i was at her house oh wow because remember the man in the military came through the roof when i was there and he had this little boy in his arms and he said he's returning what was taken from me when i was a child and we didn't quite understand that, Carl and I, but he was dressed in a mi military fatigues, and there was a chopping helicopter above the house. Mm. And then when I uh, returned home just a few days later, uh, the little rabbit was found in, the baby rabbit was found in my bed. Uh -huh. Oh, and the baby rabbit is a connection to your childhood. What, what they were returning. Yeah. Well, you, you were like, 10 years old at the time or something yeah when you ha with the baby rabbit but now right. you're an adult and right they're returning this but, baby but rabbit. i saw that it's just playing mind games i mean yeah I'm, I'm 40 i'm in my 40s and now they bring a rabbit back yeah you know, because i was upset because i was 10 years old when they took it see here's like with the whole like military thing okay uh when i look at the the capabilities of the u.s army i don't see like invisibility suits or like ted describes a military man coming through his ceiling with the noise of a chopper was, above yeah that was carla's ceiling it's carla's ce ceiling, ceiling yeah. yeah yeah uh are you open to the possibility lisa that it it, it isn't it's them always like it's it's not on our side at all but this is part of the deception because they seem to want people to have a distrust in the military. That's what I've noticed. Yes, I agree. Actually, I do think it's all one group, actually. Or not, maybe not all one, um, you know, type of AET, but all it's all one thing that's going on. And it's just part of the deception to make it so seem like it's a bunch of different groups because then there's confusion. Because one thing I've noticed um, is that Let's say I'm trying to decide something to do, and if I feel confused about it, I know it's them. So they want me to feel confused, out of sorts, like I don't know who I am, like I don't know what I would do. You know what I mean? That's them causing that for me because it helps them because then I might not figure it out at this, you know, or I might, I might slip out of their control. That's how it feels to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Going back to that thought, um, when you mentioned the Pleiadians in the book, I, I got huge red flags because you were thinking that they were love, light, and they were there to guide right. you. And I, I just, I saw right through that one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what's so funny is that, you know, that's what the media and also my medium fed me was love and light, love and light. You, you there's something wrong with you, Lisa, because you can't feel the love. You know, and so, you know, I think everyone goes through that where they buy into whatever the person is selling you. But then, you know, I don't know why, but something just changed. And maybe it was my good spirit guides. I don't know. But something changed where I started seeing things that were red flags to me in my life. Um, because I did have narcissistic parents, it turns out the medium is narcissist. And she had narcissistic parents. And some of the things she did made me question you know her judgment and because i was questioning her judgment it's like a snowball right so the snowball starts up and you're like well if that's not true then that's not true i mean so mm. that's what happened and uh, you know she was sending me to the pleiadians and sending me to the archurians and and i was just trying everything because why not you know it was just when i stopped trying everything and started really thinking about how none of this really made sense that I just started really, I guess, growing. Are you still doing energy work? No, <laughs> I'm not doing any energy work. Um, and I'm not doing any meditation. I haven't figured out what the things I want to get back to, or if I want to do any of that stuff, because it seemed to accentuate them, not me. And it also seemed like they could then also like attack me um, in a, a way that I don't know anything about. Like, for instance, 
um, you know, mentally attack me. They can uh, use all kinds of things I've never heard of. Maybe uh, like something called shadowing where they're, they're always behind you. No, that's something fair. It's been going on for the whole time, but I didn't know what it meant. I knew they were always behind me, but I didn't know what they were doing. And it turns out they're doing something called shadowing. So I don't know exactly what that is, but if that's what they're doing, they're using techniques that I don't have any concept of. Mm. And so because of that, it's all about what they can get out of me. You know, can they spin my chakras behind me? Can they? So if I'm sitting in a room in a pyramid, which makes me wonder now too about that, um, and I'm closing my eyes, they could be in there with me, you know, and aff negatively affecting me, and I wouldn't even know. Or taking What's, the energy that you're putting, generating from the pyramid. Right. Yeah. What's the uh, deal with the meditation? Because, you know, people do it as a way of relaxing, clearing the mind, okay? I first heard it in Barbara Bartholik's book where she said she leaves a list of things not to do, and one of them was don't meditate. Right. So what's the deal? Like, Do they find it easier to connect through, to your true meditation? It's an opening. You're um, open. Yeah. You're open. It expands your consciousness in a way that they can walk in. Yes. Uh, and, and it, you know, it works the same way uh, from my experience years past in, in using marijuana or drugs, you know, uh, or alcohol. You, you expand your consciousness there in a way that they can walk in and manipulate you. Right. And that's what I think once I started meditating and fall, fell into the whole thing all in, as I have a tendency to do, um, then I, the more experiences happening became even bigger because I was doing all the things that allowed them access to me and I didn't know it. And at first I thought, oh, this is so cool that blah, blah, blah happens. Well, it's not. It's really bad <laughs> It's really bad, but you just don't know it. So, uh, you know, and then, you know, the whole community of love and light are like, oh, we're contactees and we're so happy and they're helping us. And that's why I put that in the whole narcissist thing because they aren't, <laughs> they are pretending to help us. And yeah. everyone who thinks that they're being helped by them, they can't answer any of the questions of, well, why didn't they heal you when you were there? Why did they erase your memory? Why, you know, why did they come in the middle of the night? Yeah, why the middle of the night? Why didn't they, why don't they show themselves? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of questions everyone should ask themselves, but instead they believe the hype or they feel special. And I know that the ETs tell us that we're special, but here's the problem. Uh, well, don't you think, don't you think they're doing what demons are designed to do? Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. So they're doing their job and they're doing it well. They wow. are, they're doing it very well. They're massaging the ego. You're so special. I mean, I was in this one group and I'm not gonna name it, but there were people that, I, I don't want any of this to stop, then I won't be special. Well, I want it to stop, so I don't wanna be special. I don't feel like I'm special. I feel like that's a manipulation ploy. And yeah, that's just a mas ego massage. And yes, I agree, they are but demons. If you're like me, you probably feel like you're a victim. Um, I do sometimes feel like a victim, but I'm trying to get out of that because I feel like that helps them. Yeah. Well, I don't feel it so much as I did in the past, but back when I was working with Carla and Barbara Barthelick, and we were putting together Masquerade of Angels, I had a lot of anger. And you can see some of it in this book, Masquerade. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of anger. Uh, with them because I, I did feel so victimized and I felt like a fool that I had led so many people astray. Didn't yeah. you say Lisa that you were born in you grew up in Alabama? No, uh, I said I lived there. I lived in Russellville, oh, Alabama. Okay. That's where Ted uh, Oh really? Okay, um I want to uh um Ted, I just think you need to move just a little bit closer to your microphone. Okay. Um, but uh, I have a question, okay? 
And all three of you have spirit guides or have had spirit guides. Okay? So, how come they always want to distance themselves from the abductors who come in? How come it's, it's always like they're willing to relay information about them, but they always distance themselves and act like they're not part of it? Is that correct? Are, are they part of it? Are they not part of it? I they're part they're... of it. Yeah. They are. They are, absolutely. In my experience, they never distance They've said that they... Uh, we're kind of losing Jennifer. Um, Lisa, uh -oh. have, have, your, uh, have your spirit guides done the, exactly that same thing where they've d distanced themselves from the abduct abductors but really it's is it them behind the abductions i do i believe so i mean i believe it's all all connected and it's all like um it's sort of like a skit so you know guess what lisa o'hara needs a spirit guide to direct her because she needs direction in her life and I know you play the part of <laughs> spirit guide. And if she's in my area, I'll play the part and we'll just, you know, go mm -hmm. back and forth. And that way there's continuity. She thinks she's always protected and help we're helping her and it builds trust. And once it builds trust, once she relies on it, then we can do all kinds of things. That's what yeah. I think. <laughs> Jennifer, sorry, you were getting cut off there, but what were you saying? Do you want to finish? I was just agreeing with Lisa that yes, the um, the spirit guides. Well, in my case, they don't ever. They never said that they weren't part of the program. They said that they were part of it. They they have said that they're part of the abduction uh, phenomena. Wow. So they've told you they are. And Ted, what did they tell you about it? I don't, I can't recall that they uh, told me anything in particular when as as I was doing as I was doing the hypnotic regressions with Barbara and I saw more and more of how I'd been fooled, victimized, utilized in a in a, in a negative way, uh, I I developed a distrust for any of it. I mean, how can I trust any of it? And I did find, and I don't want to get off into religion, that's not what we're about, but I did find over a period of time that I had more positive results happening for me through uh, the Christ energy. And, and I have found that I, I no longer have hardly any uh, contacts at night anymore. Uh, all of this has really changed over the years for me because of that connecting that dot. And I don't say that's the answer. I'm just sharing with you uh, my experience. But so still, I can't oh, fully answer, Stuart. Uh, they didn't tell me anything. Yeah, but in a way, that's an omission in itself, isn't it? Yes. Like if they're not yeah. telling you about the a the aliens, then mm -hmm. and they're supposed I, to be I your guides. Can yeah. you hear me Lisa. okay now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's Lisa, why. I are, think... are you? Sorry. Sorry. Are you still being abducted? I am still having activities. Whether I'm being abducted, it's I. I'm not sure. I do feel like I do sometimes leave my bed. Um, you know, in the beginning, you know, I started noticing that my clothes always smelled funny and they still do. Um, so I can tell when I've left. It does seem like I am still going, uh, but I don't know where I would go. Um, I used to use sleep aids, but I realized I don't need them because they're going to knock me out and I won't remember anything uh, and I won't be able to see it in my subconscious anymore. Uh, so I have started doing regressions and it helps, but it's also very, it's sort of like takes me in different directions. I mean, it's not bad, but you know, it just takes me in different directions. One thing that's really interesting is I believe that they use like either black magic or technologies that we have never heard of or other things to make us 
very susceptible. Like for instance, for me, I'm very allergic to almost all drugs. So I can't take opioids. I can't take uh, penicillin, sulfa, a lot of stuff. And I believe it's because they've used these things on me too many times. And now I'm allergic to them. And so I think that whatever they're doing, they have to keep me, and I think a lot of us kind of drugged a lot of the time so that our perceptions aren't sharp. And, you know, I don't take any drugs. I barely will take Tylenol uh, unless I'm in a severe pain. But they are very, they use the drugs on me kind of in a regular basis. So I never really, I think that I'm just- uh, Well, it's a control drug. mechanism for them. Yeah, um, I can imagine it is. Absolutely. Yeah, so they knock me out, and I don't know with what. I thought for a while it was scopolamine, which is a um, drug, like a date rape drug or something. Uh, it makes me feel really, really strange. They was re they were re recently working on my teeth, and they're trying to get me to go to a specific, specific um, dental hygienist at my dentist, which I thought was really strange, and I didn't want to go to her, but they put me with her anyway, and I got out of it. But... Um, so I, they are doing something. Also, I have eye implants. And um, besides having cataract surgery when I was in my 30s, because suddenly I had cataracts, um, I have now have other things in my eyes. I don't know what they are. So they are taking me and doing something to my eyes. And actually, you know, this eye is my right eye. It's the one that's most affected. Uh, and this, and so I used to have, you know, two big eyes, but now I have one with a weird eyelid because of all the things I've done to my right eye. So there are things that they're doing. So I do think I am being abducted. Sometimes I can see things I feel like I shouldn't be able to see. Sometimes I'll see a black light color when I close my eyelids. And so I, yes, I am being abducted. I don't know by who. I figure it's the military. What does uh, your clothes smell like? B.O. and feet. Interesting. It's like clothes hamper, right? So like, let's say you put your clothes in the hamper and you throw them in there and they've been there a couple of days. Don't they have that funky smell of B.O. and feet? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's what yeah. it smells like. <laughs> the Because, uh, Ted, you've often described their ships as not being clean. And I'm thinking back to the... Uh, uh, the Brazilian UFO case in Virginia where there was a horrible like sulfur smell of the being yeah. uh, uh, and also people have reported like a horrible sulfur smell on the ships this I've like heard leads the gray to... smell sorry I've heard the gray smell horrible as well yeah well so... I have I have seen not not in every abduction but there have been a few that I recall where the odor was horrible. Uh, and I saw a uh, black like reptilian or maybe gray feces like on the floors of these ships. Mm -hmm. You would be walking around, stepping over. And uh, then they had little insects that nobody ever describes with me, but I've seen these, they look like big roaches and they, they, they will come out and they feed on this and they clean it up. And that's the way they clean it up. And I've seen them do, do this. So the odor it, it is horrible in, in some of those ships. And I can't describe some of it, but there is a sulfur smell. I have smelled that. Yes. Real, very strong. Yeah. Lisa, you mentioned the spiders as well in the book. Oh, yeah. Seeing the spiders. And I rarely hear people talk about the spiders. I think they're scouts, personally. But oh. I don't know. It's interesting because, um, you know, this has happened since, obviously, writing the book. But I'll be in bed and I will see colors, which I do talk about. But, you know, and I see different colors. So lately I've been seeing, interestingly, Ted, I was talking to Evie about this. 
at one of my regressions with the uh, Misha Johnston, I saw bright purple and green and bright green wow. and bright, bright purple or lime green. And so what happened was um, what ha during my regression, I had this purple smoke and it was going like this and it was covering up this bed of greenery, like ivy or grass that had eyeballs in it. And so the, the purple was covering up the eyeballs. So, um, cause I regularly see one eyed people watching me and I'll also see a black rectangle, which I used to see in my younger years of a black rectangle. I'd wake up screaming when my husband came into my uh, the bedroom. If he fell, if I fell asleep before him, I would wake up and see this black rectangle. It didn't have an eyeball in it. Now they do. But I was telling this to Evie, and she said, "Oh my God, that's Ted Rice's book. It's the cover." And I thought it was so funny. But yeah, that's what happens. So I usually see colors at night. I see the uh, I see the purple. I see the green. Uh, I used to see magenta. Sometimes I see yellow, and um, so it's just uh, interesting. Uh, what are these spiders, though? Oh, yeah, sorry, but got off on the a tangent. Um, the spiders, I don't know. So, okay, I, I'm not afraid of spiders at all, but the spiders are in my bed. I can feel spiders walking on me like as if I'm laying in a spider web. And um, early on in this journey... And they've done that. Really? Okay. I join you. I join you. I have felt them crawling all over me before. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I also wake up with bites, which I I do have stun gun marks, but so I also think some of them are spider bites, but I'm not sure. But anyway, yeah, I feel them crawling all over me and I do get bitten by something. And also early on, I would look up at like a street light and I would see a spider web. And it, so like as if, I was in a spider web. And a lot of times I feel like I am in a spider web and the more I struggle, the more I try to stop whatever is happening, the worse it gets. So, but anyway, yeah, I would see spiders regularly. Um, I felt like they were reptilian pets, um, that they were pets of reptilians and that they're very large. I used to feel them on my bed. I mean, giant ones. Sometimes I'd feel like a spider was fighting over me, you know, like they were either my protector or that I was their meal. I don't know which. <laughs> and so, yeah, the spiders are just everywhere. And then I would also see spider cats. Um, so like as if it was a hybrid, like the, an experimentation of spiders with other things. Wow. I've seen them drop down out of the ceiling and they... They come down and they're here for a bit and then they zoom back up and then that's when they come in. So that's what I was saying. Like, I think they're scouts. They come in and check out everything, make sure, I don't know, the dog's asleep, the cat's asleep, it's safe. And then. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause I have seen the three eyes uh, staring at me a lot. And um, yeah, so I don't know. It's just, a, it's all these like little things, you know, I've never heard of anyone talking about the spiders. I've never heard about people recognizing that spirit guides are bad. I mean, this is awesome because I get to talk to people who have my same experience. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I couldn't find anyone with these same experiences. Uh, you mentioned reptilians. You've had experience with them. I think I have, yes. Um, it seems like, well, first of all, they really smell. And also sometimes when they lick me, which is gross, but they have a cold tongue. And uh, also it seems well, like... Ted would know all about that. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he tongued a reptilian once. <laughs> he did what? <laughs> Ted, uh, Ted had uh, intimate relations with a uh, reptilian. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'm having trouble with that actually right now. It feels like I'm being not coerced, but um, I don't know, you know, intimate relations with uh, reptilians, like they really want that. They want that so badly. And I think it's another control mechanism. And uh, if I will just agree to it, you know, then they can get rid of my husband and take over. 
you know, or mm. take me over. They've told me, oh, we want to take you over. And I don't want that. <laughs> so, um, well, they, so, one of their objectives is to isolate us because they have better control. Right. So the more people they can keep away from us, uh, the, the, the better, the happier they are. Yeah. Uh, which is probably because they're after certain emotions, certain energies that they feed off, and they're most likely to get, get those energies if there's like a, circum a certain set of circumstances that the subject has to be under. That's why I'm guessing. Otherwise, maybe it's, maybe it's something completely different. I don't know. Well, it's interesting because um, so in eight, I was married in uh, one I wrote when I talk about being married in my old other, when my book, uh, I was married and I was married for 10 years, but I had these feelings that I was, and I thought it was my intuition telling me it's time to get a divorce. So uh, this is not in the book. So, so I like, Oh wow. My intuition is working. Wow. It's like really telling me I'm in a bad relationship and I need to get out of it. Um, and so I didn't think it was the greatest marriage. It was okay. So I decided to get a divorce and I did that. And they even sent someone in my dream to tell me, Oh, thank you. We were hoping you'd figure it out. Thank goodness. You finally figured out what we were trying to tell you about this guy. Um, and so I did get a divorce. So here I am in Arizona and I don't remember what year it was, maybe 2017, I got the same exact feeling. But I'd already been through a divorce, and I sure as hell wasn't doing it again. And I learned from my mistakes from my last marriage, and there is no way in hell I'm getting a divorce. And that's mm -hmm. what they've been trying to get me to do. Divorce Bob, my husband. Or, and then things will be the way they want them for me, horrible and miserable. <laughs> In your uh, experiences with these entities, did you ever see them feeding on anything? No. Oh, well, maybe because I had two mean coon cats and they killed both of them. So I don't know if they were feeding on them or if they were just hurting them, you know, like by giving them diseases. They both had kidney disease. They both lost a lot of weight suddenly. Um, and uh, I know they could have lasted a little bit longer and they hung on until they were 17, but it was just awful. It was like the worst experience. And I felt like they were doing that two reasons. One is to make me feel horrible during it, but also the anguish afterwards so they could feed on it. But I don't know if they were feeding on my cats. Well, they I don't feed on our emotions. Uh, yep. Okay. Yeah. And I have seen them... Uh, feeding on uh, fetuses. Oh, the, okay. the man I've seen the mansions feeding on fetuses. Okay. And, and, and that wasn't under hypnosis. I recall that awake. Okay. I saw it in more detail under hypnosis, but. Uh, I, you I haven't, haven't seen any of that, Lisa? No, I haven't. And I don't know if, uh, but I did have a hip, I had a dream about having to take care of babies that were in refrigerators. And that was a like, a what are those things called where they have the planes? It was one of those kind of plane hanger. It was a hanger and it was filled with refrigerators and all the refrigerators had babies in them. And it was my, and so I had that dream. And then I um, went through it with regression and then also with twice uh, to see if I could eke any more information out of it. But it turned out I was in charge of taking care of the babies and making sure they hadn't died or while they were in the refrigerator or that they had uh, not. Was that to make you feel important, like you had an important job there to do? I, I, I don't know. I, maybe but the thing is is that i don't have children and i don't think that's an accident i mean maybe they took all my eggs and that's part of it or it's also because i've seen too much with babies i don't know yeah the, the, sorry ted go ahead you no I, I lost my thought go on <laughs> the uh the babies you're looking after are most likely cloned babies oh uh, okay okay 
That yeah. makes sense. Because yeah. I didn't, but you know, a lot of babies look the same anyway. So maybe yeah. I just. <laughs> well, they harvest these fetuses from women who they set up to be carriers. Uh, oh. and, and they take, a lot of them are not clones. Oh. Uh, but they do clone them also. Okay. Whatever their needs are. Apparently, there's a big demand for the mantis. Oh, okay. That's their primary diet, from what I've seen. Oh, okay. Are fetuses or babies that have already been born? Mm -hmm. Ugh. I know. Well, I, you know, I bring this out to people. You know, we're dealing with reptoids, insectoids, uh, you know, that like these mantis and the grays, they're a mixture of whatever. Uh, and they, they, they're they not human, so they're not going to behave in a hum, human fashion. Uh, I can't see them going to out to a restaurant and sitting down and having a steak and baked potato and tossed salad. Right. You know, <laughs> I mean, they're going to do what their nature is. Now, that's just my opinion. I, yeah. I certainly can't say that I know everything to be 100%. But I have, I have witnessed them feeding uh, on humans. And, and also, we were talking about spiders a little while ago, and I wanted to point something out. Uh, they have a tendency on, on their side and in their ships, in that area, they enlarge these creatures. Uh, like the Bigfoot. Okay. Uh, and and uh, some of these uh, reptilians are like seven or eight feet tall. You know, so that, so uh, some of the spiders there, I once was in a ship <clears throat> and I was young. I, I'm, I'm not sure the age, I'm going to say mid-teens. I was standing by what I thought was like a, 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 a electrical pole or, or telephone pole. It was tall. It went straight up, but it was very hairy. It was huge. It was big around as, as I was. And under hypnosis, I, I won't go into detail, but under hypnosis, when I looked at that, I was standing underneath a giant, what I would say, tarantula. Huge. Massive in size. And uh, so I think I think they not only feed on our emotions, but they have to eat something true to their nature. Right. I mean, that's just my feeling. But uh, many people want to discount that and say it's preposterous, but yet they don't give a better answer. So mm. I just wanted to throw that out there about when we're talking about spiders. I don't know if anyone else has seen a giant spider. Uh, I can't recall right now speaking to anyone that has. So, uh, yeah, I, just, I want to share. All right, Lisa. Um, so when you wrote the book, they started punishing you, okay? And what other methods did they use to uh, to get back at you? Um. The primary one at first was, uh, it seems like once you figure something else, they escalate. So uh, the primary one for me was for them to rehearse with me to tell me what they wanted me to say. And if I said anything that they didn't like, then they would like do something to the show. Like for instance, I was on a show with uh, somebody, I can't remember, I think it was Into the Paranormal or one of those. And um, and so I said something that they didn't like, and so they got, got a strike on YouTube or they pulled the plug somehow, so it's not on anymore. So uh, that's, that's what started happening. I finally realized that they were, it wasn't me rehearsing my what I wanted to say and that I didn't need to rehearse because some of these things were happening to me a long time ago, which I'd never noticed weren't me. So when I was rehearsing, I just thought that was me, you know? And so, but then I would have an idea and I know that was them too, mischievous idea. And I would say it and then I would get punished. And so it was sort of like that where as long as I was doing, even if I was doing what they said, 
which was negative, they would still punish me. So I finally realized that it was punishment no matter what, because I wrote the book. And in truth, instead of writing the book in order to stay off of their radar, I should not have written the book because get, writing the book and doing what they said was a punishment. So that's when I just started realizing that anything time I do what they say, I'll be punished. Yeah. And um, you had um, uh, in your book, you had, oh, sorry, I've lost it now. Oh, what was it? Ah, it's gone. It'll come back, I'm sure. Like, um, uh, okay. I've got a question. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Um, you mentioned a large computer in, um, in your in the book. I don't remember if I wrote the page down. You it's mean chapter the, eight. It's for CRT. CRT. You mean like a computer monitor? I think it was the computer monitor. And, well, let me share my experience and then maybe it, okay. it'll come back. So where I used to live, I used to see this. It was like a window opening. And I would see these men behind all these monitors. They had button down shirts on with collars and they were talking to each other. But they were in my apartment as well. I could see them. Hmm. And I think you mentioned something about being watched in that respect. Um, I don't remember that particular thing. I did read, just read my book, but um, I did write about uh, trying remote viewing and having... That was it. It was remote viewing. <laughs> okay. Exactly. All right. Yes. Yes. All right. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I just, I like to try things. You know, I read a book and I feel like whatever the book hat wrote about a book that influenced them, then I want to read those books. And so that's how I ended up. And it was pretty, it felt like happenstance, but I, I probably wasn't now that I know more. But um, I read the book by David Morehouse about his uh, controlled remote viewing experiences. And I wanted to try it, but of course I had it on Kindle and it didn't come with a CD. And so then I bought the book and it didn't come with a CD. And eventually I just did try try it. And when I tried it, um, I had, you know, I started smelling smells which weren't in my room. And then I tried it again and I felt like I actually now know the term for it, I bilocated. Yeah. And so that means that I was in two places at the same time and I didn't know it though because I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know I could do that, <laughs> you know? I was just trying it for the heck of it, you know? So when I bilocated, I bilocated to some, I think now is a skiff, which in DOD terms is special compartmentalization slash facility. So it doesn't have any windows. It doesn't allow, you know, your monitor to talk to other monitors you know, or any information to get out. So that's what it was. It was a skiff, but it was, it feels like it was back in time because it, everyone was weren't using CRTs, which are giant boxy monitors. And uh, they were all in business clothing. They were drinking coffee and I suddenly appeared there. And when I did, uh, somebody said, oh, there you are. <laughs> and I was like, holy moly, I, gotta get out. I don't know what this is. I mean, that really scared me. Um, and then, you know, it seemed like they were trying to keep me from doing that again. But for me at the time, I thought it was, I, they were trying, they, or I, I felt I was spurred on to do more. So I did try it again. And then eventually I couldn't see anything cause they blocked me. So I do have a block on my subconscious and, um, others blocks. And when I find these blocks, they're always cubes, they're black cubes. So I don't know what That's that really means. Interesting. Yeah. So the things that they're having me involved in, I don't even know what they are, seriously. And I didn't know I was a remote viewer. Um, so what? It's like you went back in time and appeared in front of these, like, we'll just say CIA guys. Yes. <laughs> and then their response to you wasn't like, oh, my God, who the hell is that? It was, oh, there you were. I, I don't know. You know, that's the whole thing is that it wasn't. It's sort of like these pictures I get. They're supposed to mean, 
or they mean something to the person who's sending them. They don't doesn't necessarily mean what I think it means. And so when I get these pictures, I don't know what their intent is. And that's why it took so long for me to figure out what, what I should or shouldn't do with this stuff because it's not, it's their intent is not obvious to me. And I don't know if it's because I'm not very smart or they turn using the, their uh, perception dial, they turned it down low so I wouldn't know so they could see what I would do. I don't know. But so the pictures, since they all have an, a certain intent by the sender, there's no way to know if you're getting them, if you're a receiver, which I believe I am, there's no way for me to know what they want me to do with the information. Over time, I have learned, don't do what they, so if you see a restaurant show up in your mind, don't go there. <laughs> you know? Please, um, but, let, yeah. me, let me share with you. I have found over the years that oftentimes they will give unclear you know, information in order to get us chasing something different instead of paying attention to what they're actually doing. Yes, distracting. Uh, so that's an entrapment sometimes. Yes. Yes, it's interesting because uh, a couple of days ago, I wanted to go to lunch. Now, for a while, they would tell me, you have two choices. You can go here or here. And I would say, well, I know there are other choices. In fact, I'm going to choose this third choice. Screw you, basically. Um, so they kind of gave up on that. But uh, since I know I shouldn't go to where they're pointing me to, um, I try not to. But, some, but sometimes they want to trap me. So they'll have my husband suggest that restaurant so that I have to go there. And I don't talk to my husband about this stuff because it's outside of his worldview and it's just it's easier if I don't so I just went there and of course there was a it was a trap so and the trap was that there was multiple people there and they could do their whatever their voodoo or their black magic on me that's what it seems like happens so mm. in your book you outline um, some steps that people can take to uh, help stop what's going on now yeah. you've said that you can't use these steps there because they have prevented you from using them but can you talk about them sure sure um i found these two books and again i believe they gave them to me or somebody did uh but they were from Stuart wordlow and um one was called the hyperspace helper and here it is mm. I hate this backwards. Okay. Um, and then healing archetypes and symbols. Here's the book for that. And okay. it's uh, anyway. So I just went through, I, I went through some of these exercises in here and the hy hyperspace helper, they have something called the green spiral staircase, which I didn't realize is actually hypnosis tool. <laughs> um, so, so when I was trying it, I was just trying everything, you know? So I would use, I would, you know, clear my mind and then think of the thing I wanted to see uh, or, or, you know, the other half of the dream, for instance, of, uh, of any of the dreams that I put in my book. And then I would just close my eyes and think of going down this spiral staircase. And then I would feel like I need to jump off at some time. And then I, a scene would appear because they'd be a screen from my subconscious and um, then I would watch the scene and then I would uh, come out of it by going to Brown. And whenever I looked at that um, screen, if I thought it was false, I could put an orange color on it because that's what Stuart Swerdlow says to put uh, an orange color on it. And it would also, it would change colors if it wasn't true. So I did that with a lot of my my thing is um, I also canceled everything out and then I would go to brown, which is the color of grounding to get out of that. And, um, you know, I just tried to use it for everything, you know, because you never know what's going to work. Um, it's called the brown X and you say, I now brown X out all unnecessary negativity in my life. And um, I now brown X out, fill in the blank. And uh, then it helps. It really helps you and it actually does really work 
as far as I didn't think it worked because I was having such a hard time, but I didn't know it was because they were blocking everything, you know, things you learn later. But from what I heard from other people, they do use that and it does work. You also have to put on protection, which is a, a violet tet tetrahedron, and that helps protect you. But for me, once I use any type of protection, it only works once and then they block it. Um, so, Which kind of tells me it's not really protection then. Yes. If they it can is. block it. Well, I think that it's my personal opinion. And Stuart Swordlow is an odd guy. But it seems to me that he <laughs> is, uh, and he's also probably targeted. And so when you give out tools, then they can find some way around them. Like as if they have technology that can uh, avail them of the power to block it. Or maybe they have some master black magic people that can block it. I mean, so I don't know. I don't, like I said, I feel like I jumped in thinking that I had all the answers and then found out that it was only the beginning of my journey. <laughs> I had no idea, <laughs> right? What yeah. I was really in store. <laughs> all right. Uh, is there anything else you guys want to ask before we go? I have one more question. Do you see spirits? Do you see deceased loved ones? Um. I do, but I only at certain times. Now, I don't know why. So I don't see my actual deceased loved ones. I only hear them, which leads me to believe that I may be hearing other people, you know, yeah. like others. See, I question that in my life as well. I, I often see family members who passed on, but I don't know anymore if that's them or if that's the... the uh, Entities in disguise because they have the ability to do that. Yes, and I so. think it's a hook. I think a lot of these things are hooks. So okay. it's a way to hook you. So, you know, it's like you say, oh, look, here's your deceased dad. Here is his message. And it's a way of hooking you in so that they can do more. Right. Yes. Yeah. Using it as bait. Right, exactly, exactly, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. And I actually also feel like you, Ted, that I think God is the answer. And I don't think it's, I don't, I'm not extremely religious and I've tried all the religions and I was Catholic and, you know, all that stuff. But um, yeah, I think a lot of those have been corrupted. And I do think having um, the spirit of Christ or uh, Jesus or all of those, any of those primary creator, whatever you think is really important because it really grounds us and it makes us feel not alone. So I think it's- Well, I, I know for a fact that they, they do not like Jesus Christ. Yeah. And they will back up. Yeah, they do. And so, that very thing right there should not be forgotten in any researcher's life, in my opinion. I, and we should dive more into what's behind that. Yes. Uh, yes. It's just it, information. Because if they ever come in mass forces on this planet and try to overtake humanity, right? that, that may be a tool we need to fight back with we don't know i agree so, so i don't discount it but i don't understand it all either but i know it works for me i agree and i wish that we had i mean as time's going on i'm finding it's harder and harder to find information and uh you know like you said let's get look behind it it's really hard i mean they're limiting the information you can get and uh so how do we go about finding out what's behind it? What's behind uh, God? So I don't know the answer. Well, I have found, and I'm certainly not in every case, but I have found over the years that people that are really heavy, I would say you said word heavy into their church and their religion very strongly, and they go to church a lot and they do a lot of praying. Mm -hmm. uh, they they don't have uh, 
that many uh, what I would call contacts. Yeah. Uh, now, I have met some that have had some, so I'm not ruling it out, but most of the ones that I know don't have these contacts like you and I have shared. Okay. All right, Jennifer, do you want to say anything before we go? Thank you for coming. It's been a pleasure. I loved your book. I'd love to see number two. <laughs> I'll have to think about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'd love to learn what you had learned in the, the regressions and what you're, you know, what you've, um, you know, the conclusion. I'd love to see that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Who knows? Lisa, thank you so much for being a guest on our program today. I've really enjoyed you. And maybe we can do this again sometime. Yeah, let's definitely do it. I, I thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be on your show. I've watched you uh, a couple of your shows as, whenever I can find them on YouTube, and sometimes I can't. Um, but yeah, or let's just have chats. Um, we don't have to be on a show, do we? <laughs> no. no, no, of course not. No, we can <laughs> chat without being on a program. <laughs> okay, let's do that. <laughs> All right. Um, Till the next time, listeners.